Welcome to today's field work trip. Today we're going to cover how to lead and run a beginner's session on stand-up paddle boarding. When you're planning sessions, you always need to consider what are the outcomes you want your participants or your clients or your friends to get out of doing your activity. We're choosing stand-up paddle boarding because it's a paddling activity, it's a marine activity, it requires very little equipment and it's fun. It's also something that's used a lot now in programs, in schools. Um, it's used for fun by a lot of different people and it has a whole lot of different forms. So stand-up paddle boarding is our focus today. But before we get focused in on that, let's think about how we plan our programs. As with every outdoor pursuit and every outdoor activity in a program, once you're happy that the activity that you've chosen will help you to meet whatever the outcomes are that you want to get from your program or give to your clients or for your friends, then you need to think about the area in which you're going to be going. So you need to choose what area is appropriate and when you consider that you need to consider things like boundaries, catching beaches, exit points, entry points, access to medical aid, ambulance access, those sorts of things. And so you have to also consider with, amongst that the weather, particularly with marine activities, which direction the wind is and where will your participants be pushed if you have a strong wind. If you're under the water and in the water, as in diving, the wind is still a consideration, but it's very important when you're above the water and sitting on top of the water. So today, the first preparation that you need to understand and to think about is what is the effect of the wind on the area you've chosen. I've chosen Sandringham Beach and I've chosen this area here which has some very clear boundaries, I'll talk about them later, but also today's forecast was for a north wind of about 30 kilometres an hour or about 12 to 15 knots. A north wind, if you can see the city in the background here, basically north is up here and a north wind will push my participants if they get stuck and fall off back to the beach. It is very important that when you're considering where you run your session that you have that safety feature in a, in a wind stronger than anything of about eight knots that the wind is going to push your participants towards the beach and not away and out to sea. This area also has very good entry and exit points. If you can see you have clear boundaries of a jetty, boat moorings and a rock wall so you can run games and activities with clear boundaries. Also if you look behind you you have very clear ex entry for an ambulance to drive straight down onto the wharf. So you also have here a Hampton railway line and station, Sandringham station, they're all 10 minutes walk. So it's a great place for anybody to learn how to sup or to have a general sup no matter what level you're at. Once you've chosen your area and you're happy with it, then you do the normal procedures that you need to plan for any outdoor pursuit. You've checked your weather, you've done your risk management, you've got your medical forms, and you've given your participants a list of equipment that they need to bring, where they have to be, how long the session will be, and anything else that you require from them. Before we get going with all the details of today, I'd like to acknowledge that we're standing on the traditional land of the Bulurong people, who are part of the Kulin Nation, and to pay my respect to Elders past, present and emerging. As a leader, as you are aware by now, you need to carry specific equipment. You need to carry more than if you're a participant. We've covered risk management plans, medical forms, trip plans, and other paperwork associated with running a program. You also need to have some sort of comms. This is a normal iPhone in a waterproof case, and you can then back that up by putting it in a dry bag as well, so that you have some sort of comms if you're gonna be going any distance further than just a couple of hundred meters offshore. 
You also need to have the group first aid kit. Either if you're going a long distance, it needs to be in a dry bag. If you're only going a short distance, it has to be readily be able to be reached on shore and easily identified. The group first aid kit has a lot more gear in it for first aid situations than the normal first aid kit that the students will be carrying. Also as a leader you should take extra sunscreen because students often forget their sunscreen, participants often forget their sunscreen. When you're doing water-based activities try and get the sunscreen that does not have an effect on the marine life. So this sunscreen here has been specifically designed not to have a, a detrimental effect on marine life. I also find that it's um, easier for sun, sunscreen to stay on if I use zinc but it depends personally on what you prefer. For your participants equipment you have a whole series of other things that they need to include. They need to have their own personal first aid kit which is in a backpack on the shore just for backup. They need to have some warm clothing to change into, obviously a towel, some snacks and water is obvious. Their own sun protection as I've just talked about before and some eye protection. When you're doing water-based activities you need to have some sort of eye protection that if you fall in the water you're not going to lose your eye protection or just have some really cheap sunnies that if you lose them you're not worried about the fact that they've sunk to the bottom of the ocean. But a little bit of string goes a long way particularly if they're expensive glasses. Let's get down to clothing and gear. For personal clothing for out on the water and this applies to lots of marine activities you need gear that will keep you warm. Obviously wetsuits are the first port of call. They keep you warm by sealing a warm layer of wet water between the neoprene of the wetsuit and your skin. If it's a warm day like today and you're not going to be out on the water very long then you probably can get away with not wearing a wetsuit. But if the temperature is below 20 degrees I would ensure that you put your participants in wetsuits, particularly beginners because they tend to fall in quite a bit which is part of the experience. So wetsuits, the cooler it is the thicker the wetsuit. Long arms, long sleeves and maybe a 4-3 or a 2-3 which is a 4 millimeters by 3 millimeters thick. So a wetsuit is a great idea. You don't have to have participants missing out on this activity if they can't swim. If they're confident to use a PFD they can certainly join in this activity by wearing a PFD. I would as a matter of what is it just definitely do it I suppose is I would put my participant in a wetsuit and a PFD and before they started I would pop them in the water to see that they're confident that they can float with the PFD. In other words are they happy and they won't panic when they fall in the water because they now realize that the PFD will hold them up. This is not just for non-swimmers. You can put all sorts of people with any swimming ability in a PFD. For the activity we're doing today we're not legally required to put people in a PFD. However, I would encourage it, particularly if you're hiring SUPs or yachts or anything like that. A yacht you have to have a PFD, but if you're hiring a SUP from a, a um, business that provides a life jacket or a PFD, then I would use it and put all my participants in it, particularly if they're under the age of 18. Personal clothing. On sunny days, obviously we have sun protection. Your traditional bushwalking hat, once it's wet, is not going to be great. The brim will get floppy and hang in the face. You need a brim that will stay up when it's wet, like this. Or if you happen to have a surf hat, like this, which clips on so it doesn't come off. And it also has a hard brim at the front of it. 
I used to think these were pretty daggy surfing and paddling in these even though I wore them but I've noticed that uh, some of the top surfers are now wearing them so they're becoming cool. If it's a warm day and you don't want to wear a wetsuit you need some clothes that are quick dry and offer some sun protection. So your traditional rash vest is fine and some sort of clothing that when it gets wet it doesn't drag off you and drag you down. So something that's reasonably tight fitting and that will wick off the water quick enough so it doesn't pull you down if you, when and if you get wet. So if, you, if it's a warm day and you don't need a wetsuit, you still need some protection and you need something that doesn't get heavy when it gets wet. One more consideration is footwear. As an outdoor leader, you should always have closed toe shoes on. So you shouldn't rock up to a session in thongs. For example, I'm in some closed toe shoes now. These shoes also can get wet. You can wear them sailing, you can wear them paddling. But you can also wear ones that are not um, going to be as heavy when they get wet and that's things like wet booties. You can wear these sea kayaking, you can wear them paddling um, and they just offer protection when you're in a rocky area or an area where you're likely to get some sort of damage to your feet. When you're in a beach like this with a sandy surface underneath you don't necessarily need to put your participants in footwear like this. However, if you're in a sea kayak or if you're in a yacht or if you're in a area with rocky sandy or any other sort of terrain that may cause damage to your feet you need to put your participants into some footwear. Once you've got all your bits and pieces in place such as what venue you're going to use all your safety equipment and safety paperwork completed and your participants have got all the equipment that they personally need, you need to decide what is the best board that you're going to hire or that you have for your participants to use. For stand-up paddle boarding there's a huge range on offer and you can hire boards for as cheap as $20 an hour or you can buy top of the range boards. There is inflatables, which a lot of people are using now, um, and they have their place. They're great if you don't have a roof rack to carry your board, and they're easy to pack away. You have to pump them up, and they are nice and solid on the water, but they feel a little bit wobbly, and they're harder to pack, paddle in a wind. And today, the wind has really picked up. It's about 50, no, no, it's probably about 12 knots now so it's harder on an inflatable to paddle. You have a whole range of boards. Today we're going to be using um, the boards that I have, our family has. They are designed specifically for being in the surf but they also can be paddled on flat water. You can't do downwind racing or long flat water races in them, they're too slow but they are very manoeuvrable for being on the waves. So you need three things, a paddle, a leash which you must ensure that your students put on so that if they fall and get they don't get separated from their board because that is their flotation device and you need your board selecting the right length of paddle for your participants is important so there is a range of paddles from lightweight carbon fiber through to a basic paddle it's the length that's the most important when your participant puts their hand up, it should come to their wrist. Some paddles have the flexibility of having adjustable, adjustable paddle length. So you can adjust them to the side, height and side, just check there's no water in there, and you can adjust them to the height of your participants to make sure that it's the right height. So again, just to the height of their wrist. Once you've got the paddle length right and you've got your board, it's simply a matter of getting on the water. These are quite big, they've got a big surface area and if it's windy they can be hard to paddle, uh, hard to carry I mean. You need to, you need to look after your back. So what you need to do is make sure that you walk with your board into the wind. Firstly, flip it up 
away from you. In this board I have a handle that pops out. In other boards you just literally pop your handle in the handle spot there and then with your knees bent you lift it up. For us the wind's coming from over here to the north. So we're going to try and walk and keep the board pointing directly into the wind so it doesn't push us around. Once you've got your participants down on the water, you need to go through a few more safety tips before you go into instruction on how they paddle the board. The first thing is to set some clear boundaries and make some markers. For example, in this particular setting, I'm going to make that the boundary is simply between these boats, the pier and the beach. It's a nice contained small area to get people's basic skills going. And then once those skills are sort of fine-tuned a little bit, we have an opportunity to venture out further or even go on a bit of a tour. In a place like this, I would take the group out through, winding through these boats here, as long as they've got enough ability to steer around and not hit the boats. And then you'll see in the distance that there's a couple of rock walls and a big wide beach. You can take them on a tour across to the big wide beach, do some games and activities on the water over there, or you could take them into one of these areas bounded by these rock walls. So it's a great area for teaching and setting some clear boundaries. The other safety thing that you need to consider is some sort of signals. So the universal signal for help if you're in distress obviously is this. Another signal that's important that you should teach your students is you're going to ask them are they okay and they need to signal back to you yes we're okay. You can actually play a whole series of games where the students are all rafted up. When I, what I mean by rafting up is that they're all close together and you can do things like piano keys which you run along the boards and change positions. Uh, unfortunately we don't have a class here at the moment to do that and show you but there's some good footage on some good YouTube videos that I'm going to recommend for you. That's enough on safety tips. Let's just go a few other basics before we hop in the water. Once you've gone through your signals, there's a couple of other basic tips that you need to cover with your students before they hop on the water. They need to make sure that they have their leg rope on. It's normally around the ankle. However, this one is a knee leg rope. They need to have their paddle and you need to show them how to grip it. The paddles have a definite, definite forward and back and you can feel it when you grab the paddle. It'll feel wrong if you grab it the wrong way. And the blade should always be facing with this slightly bent forward to the front. Normally you have the artwork also at the front. So the student is going to be in a position where the top hand is on the T of the paddle, the other hand is comfortably about a metre down the paddle, and the blade is with the bent part of it facing forward. In terms of a basic stroke, you just need to make sure that when the participants are on their boards, standing almost in the centre of the board, they're going to reach forward and pull back to the waist. Forward and pull back to the waist. We'll cover more strokes when we're on the water and there's some other videos that I'm going to recommend that you watch. Next thing, how to launch. Simply ask the students to float their boards in the water just a little point about that 
I pulled my board along that last bit of the water and I would normally not do that but it's very windy right now and if I picked it up I would have a chance of it flipping into another participant which is why I dragged it. Try and get the participants not to drag their equipment, it damages the fins long term if you did it every time just to pick the board up and pop it in the water. However when it's windy like this you need to think of the safety of your other participants. Hopping on. So hop on. Start by kneeling. They can start paddling by kneeling in a kneeling position and then when they're confident they can stand up. To start off, start on your knees. So give the board a gentle push out and then hop on your board on your knees. You can simply paddle on your knees for as long as you want. If it's particularly windy, you can paddle the whole session on your knees. Once you're feeling confident, simply place your hands on the board and stand up. Most boards will start to turn after a couple of strokes of paddling on one side. So do a couple of strokes on one side. As you feel the board start to turn, swap and paddle on the other side. Your paddle should go in near the front of your board and you should pull it out of the water near your hips, remembering to have the blade with the bend facing forward. When you want to stop your board, you need to do the same stroke but backwards. And you do some strong strokes, three or four, and it will stop you. Then you can paddle forward again. If you need to turn, there's two effective ways of doing it. One is just to do a forward sweep stroke where you reach further and your, your paddle goes out wide on one side. However, that will be a long turning circle. If you would like to turn a little bit quicker, you do a long sweep stroke on one side and then you do a reverse sweep stroke on the other side. Remember the difference between a normal paddle where your paddle goes in and draws towards you along the edge of the board. A sweep stroke goes out wider so your paddle is further from the board which means it's a further fulcrum and it will push the board in the opposite direction to which the paddle wants to go. You can then turn the board in either direction and then you can add this with a combination with your straight paddle and you can basically go anywhere. In wind like we've got today you'll be pushed by the prevailing wind a certain direction and you may have to do a lot more paddles or strokes on one side than the other. Try and not get into a situation where you're so far from where you started off that it's difficult to get back. But it's a really simple skill. A couple of forward paddles, a couple of back paddles or back strokes and some side sweeps. And you've got it. When you're coming into shore, I've seen a lot of people fall and actually hurt their ankles by trying to step off straight onto the stand. Kneel down and hop off gently. Simple as that. Something interesting to observe right now is that the wind's come up. It's almost 20 knots. This would be your cutoff wind for taking a group. It would be too difficult for them to maintain and get back to the beach unless they were blown back into the area like we've set here on wind any stronger than this. So again, it's always about the weather. In particular, it's always about the wind. If you have a look out to sea now, you can see, if you can see through all those boats, quite a lot of white caps. So we're up to between probably 15 knots now, reaching up to 20 at times. So now you have to reconsider how you will conduct your program. For me, if you have a look behind you, on the other side of the pier here, it's a little more sheltered. And I would get the group to go under the pier and I'd run my program there. All right, I've got some other videos I want you to watch. Hope you can hear in this wind about the other ways that you can use supping or stand up paddling for touring, for surfing, for foiling, and I've got some videos I'd like you to watch. And finally, pack up. Again, ask the students to help pack up, clean the boards, make sure you have all your gear, wash your wetsuits, wash your, wash your PFDs, and then 
gather them together and have a little bit of a reflection on how they felt they went and what they enjoyed. Don't forget when you're planning your programs, put lots of games and activities for your on, on water um, program so that you can mix it up so they're not totally concentrating the whole time on how to paddle. You learn quickly if you just get out there and give it a go and fall in heaps. And if you're playing games, you don't think about how you're paddling and you automatically learn the strokes. So I hope you enjoy our session when we do get out on the water together. And I hope you enjoy taking future people out to have fun on the water.